So I'm thrilled to be here tonight, representing the dental school, uh, to tell you about the three intersecting worlds of science that I inhabit every day. And I'm going to do that by telling you three different stories. So the first story I call the magic of stem cells. This world of discovery where we can do things that even five years were completely unimaginable. The second story I'm going to tell you is about my transformative Tufts moment, where I acquired a new understanding of my responsibility as a scientist in society. And I'll tell you that moment when I became what I call a civic scientist. The third story I'm going to tell you is about how I and a group of wonderful faculty from around the university took that understanding into the undergraduate classroom to teach college freshmen at Tufts, amazing college freshmen, help them find their own voice in the science conversation. Now, all of this is what I call bringing science to life. And it is amazing bringing science to life in the laboratory. Love it. But bringing science to life in the mind of a Tufts undergraduate is absolutely unparalleled. And I will share that experience with you. And we have two amazing students who will also share their experiences with you as they were doing that. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do with stem cells. So I can tell you that we can take a tiny piece of skin from any one of you in the audience, you're all adults, and we can take that cell, grow them out, those green cells that you're seeing on the screen, and we can push them back to an embryonic state within a month on a plastic dish, essentially rebooting the hard drive of those cells through a process called reprogramming that was awarded the Nobel Prize in medicine three years ago. By reprogramming these cells, we can push them back to an embryonic state. And why is that so important? Because we have the capacity to take embryonic cells and make them into any cell type in the body. We can make them into lung cells, into kidney cells, into heart cells, and I make them into liver cells, but as into skin cells. While we do that, we actually rejuvenate the biological properties of these cells so that we can transfer them back to the host, back to the person that they were derived from, and treat a variety of diseases that have been due to loss of tissue because of disease. And we can regenerate and reconstitute tissues and organs using this technology. Now, the diseases that we choose to treat are chronic diseases. We do this by combining these amazing stem cell technologies, using this reprogramming technology with what we call tissue engineering. So we can make, in the laboratory, artificial tissues and organs on demand and have them in ready supply to replace or regenerate damaged tissues and organs. Now, I do this using human skin. And in fact, I happen to have a small sample of human skin that I brought along with me for demonstration purposes. And here we see human skin that's grown in the laboratory. Actually, this is done in collaboration with my colleagues at Organogenesis, a company in Canton, Massachusetts. And you can see the skin is growing on this little plastic surface. And what we can do is we can take this little piece of skin that I will, actually, we can pass this around later with the hors d'oeuvres, so we'll be able to get this <laughs> distributed to you. So here it is, skin that we made from scratch in the laboratory. I can hold it up. It has all the properties of human skin. I can pull on it. I can see through it. And what it's used for is as a biological bandage to cover wounds that don't heal. And this skin releases materials that jumpstart the wound healing process in the tissue underneath. So we use it to treat chronic wounds in diabetic patients who, if not treated in this way, would suffer from amputation because of gangrene and non-healing wounds. Now, I have to tell you that the power of stem cells is demonstrated in this skin because we've been using the same skin for all of my experiments for the last 12 years. 
And that skin, actually, those cells come from human foreskin. <laughs> Sal, Sal's with me on this one, right? <laughs> now, what's incredible, human foreskin actually has the highest percentage of stem cells of any skin that we can find, obviously because it's a neonatal skin. And I can tell you, if you're using the same foreskin cells for 12 years, we will be celebrating the foreskin's bar mitzvah <laughs> next year. And we're actually, actually it's funny because my rabbi is in the audience tonight. Rabbi Waldox is here. Uh, April 2016, Rab Moshe, please. But it does show the incredible power of stem cells, the use of these incredible technologies. So you'd say, wow, the sky's the limit. We have incredible opportunities to use these stem cells for human therapy, but that's not the case. The reality is there's a shadow and a cloud hanging over the field of stem cell research. And that is because we still need to use human embryonic stem cells derived from human embryos as the gold standard by which we compare these amazing reprogrammed cells. Well, what's the problem? Well, harvesting embryonic stem cells from human embryos results in the destruction of those embryos. And there's a stem cell debate that's still raging in this country about whether or not the ethical, legal, political conversation about this is being violated. And this brings me to my second story, that transformative moment. August 2010, I was sitting by my desk at my phone. I get a phone call from Boston Globe reporter Karen Weintraub, who calls and says, I need to interview you. What do you think about the federal court ruling that has ruled that embryonic stem cell research is unconstitutional? I sat there for a moment, and I thought to myself, I have no idea what she was talking about. I was completely blindsided. I was so focused on my research, so focused on what was happening in my lab that I was completely unaware of the broader impact of my science, the ethical, legal, political, moral implications of my stem cell research. So I decided at that moment, my transformative moment, I needed to be part of this conversation. I needed to be part of the conversation so I could engage in the conversation about the implications of my work. And as I acquired that understanding, at the interface of science and society, at the interface of our conscience and capabilities, I realized that I needed to share that understanding with some learners. And the community that I decided to share that with was Tufts undergraduates. So I gathered together an incredible group of Tufts faculty from every school around the university. And we decided to teach a course that would allow Tufts students to acquire the indispensable tool of being able to engage thoughtfully and meaningfully in the science conversation. In a small group dynamic seminar where students could share their personal beliefs and values about issues that are science-based that they care about the most. Now, we called our class Science and the Human Experience. And in our class, we deal with the questions, more questions than answers, of the big issues of our day that are based in science. Questions about when life begins. What defines personhood? Since I can sequence my genome, do I want to know my genome? We just asked that question in class last week. And if I know my genome, what will I do with that information? Will I be able to keep it private? Who do I share it with? And as we dealt in this conversation and delved into it deeply, our students first acquired a basic foundational science literacy that allowed them to engage in the conversation. Many of our students have interest in the humanities and social sciences and felt quite distant from science, but once they had the conversational language to engage in the science conversation, they could find meaning. They could begin to interpret how science-based issues impact their daily lives. They understood that their own certainties in science there are gray areas. It's not all black and white. And they grappled with these questions with that in mind. And as they did, something remarkable happened. 
The conversation in the classroom turned into a conversation about diversity and inclusivity of opinions, of points of view, where students shared a spectrum of values and beliefs that were different than their own. And ultimately, the goal was to help our students find their voice in the science conversation. So the incredible experience of hearing our students' voice, I wanted to share with you tonight. So I have two wonderful students who will tell you a little bit about their experience. So our first student is Daniel Weinstein. Daniel is a remarkable freshman who Dean Abriola, I'm happy to say, is a biomedical engineering student. <laughs> nope, but I've already recruited him to my lab for the summer, so he's not going to be in David Kaplan's lab this summer. His hometown, local, and in fact, his mom is in the audience also. So I'd like to call <laughs> Daniel, please come up to the stage for a second. Thank you, Dr. Garlick. It's an honor to be here tonight. The classroom environment of the seminar I am now taking as a Tufts freshman is, a one, is wonderful in many ways. As a small group seminar, it's a class where I get to know all of my classmates in a deeper way. As a result, I feel comfortable opening up by sharing my personal experiences and opinions with them. Everyone in the class shows a deep respect and interest in what others think and feel, even if they have conflicting views. This dynamic and respectful classroom environment has allowed me to find my inner voice about a scientific topic that's really important to me. In class, we were discussing assisted reproductive technology, ART for short, especially the moral implications of generating embryos without allowing them to develop into people. We asked the question, what is the value of the human embryo? Should we protect a four-day-old human embryo or can we use it to try to cure diseases? One of my classmates strongly advocated that all embryos should be given the chance to develop fully. I felt compelled by her beliefs to share with the class that I had been born through ART. In many situations, ART creates multiple embryos in the lab, but only one is implanted and allowed to grow. I thought about the multiple excess embryos sitting in ART freezers and those that were being used for research. I then realized that some people see the creation and use of these embryos as unethical, simply because they have the potential to develop into human beings. I knew the story of my birth since I was a child, but thanks to this course, I'm beginning to consider its ethical questions. Our conversation about the value of the human embryo instantly became real and tangible inside of our classroom. At first, I wasn't sure how my classmates would react to my story. However, after I finished speaking, my classmates expressed gratitude and admiration toward my openness. This experience built trust and openness that has allowed us to, de to delve deeply into many other topics that make us think about our technological abilities and our social conscience. As a freshman studying biomedical engineering, I have a lifetime of science ahead of me. Dr. Garlick and his amazing team of caring Tufts faculty showed me the importance of making scientific concepts of accessible to people of all backgrounds, thus involving all people in a scientific conversation. I learned that everyone's perspectives are valuable and lead to a rich and exciting dialogue. Finally, the reason I enrolled in science and the human experience reflects the reason that I came to Tufts. During my college experience, I want to learn not only the technical aspects of science, but I also want to experience the philosophical and social potential of science and learn how it affects our lives. I chose Tufts knowing that it will prepare me to be ethically and socially responsible in both my professional and personal life. I want to thank all of you here tonight for helping create such a unique and exciting environment by making Tufts such a special place for students like me. Thank you. Our next student is Gabrielle Fenaroli. When I heard that name and it flowed off my tongue, I was picturing the Tuscan Hills. I said, Gabrielle, where are you from? And she says, I'm from Kansas. <laughs> but I'm so pleased you're here. 
So Gabrielle was in our class last year, Science and the Human Experience, and she brings a slightly different perspective. She's a double major in economics and art history and brings the world of the social sciences and the humanities into the classroom. So Gabrielle, please join us. Good evening, everyone. I'm so honored to get the opportunity to talk to you tonight about a class that I can honestly say changed my life. I'll be the first one to admit I used to just like science. Well, okay, it was more like I hated science. <laughs> Upon hearing that I needed two science classes to graduate Tufts, I promptly called my mom crying. <laughs> Little did I know, the science class I would end up taking would forever change my life. I knew from the minute Dr. Garlic walked into the room and introduced, introduced himself as Cool Johnny that he would turn into a significant <laughs> mentor and friend. I soon found my classmates would become a community with whom I could share a safe space to talk about science-based issues that really mattered to us. The reason I was drawn to the class in the first place was because the summer before coming to Tufts, my little sister was diagnosed with dyslexia. I watched my parents search for answers about why Serena was so willing to learn, but at such a difficult time in a conventional classroom setting. I was frustrated that my parents had such a difficult time accessing understandable scientific information on dyslexia. It seemed like there was this great schism between this information and those who were suffering from this disorder and desperately needed it. Through this class, I saw a path, not only for me and my family, but for everyone. I began to appreciate that by being science literate, I could understand the nuances of the important science-based issues of our day. I gained the confidence that even I, an economics and art history major, could join the conversation. I decided to take action. I wrote an op-ed called The War on Words, where I advocated for scientists to make un information about dyslexia more accessible to the public. I left the class with the feeling as though there was hope for my sister and others with dyslexia, who needed to be understood and not labeled. I was empowered. I realized I had a transformative experience. This was the first time someone asked me how I felt about science. The classroom was an open forum for conversation and growth. One moment in particular speaks to the power of this learning experience for me. That's when I expressed an interest in discussing health disparities between low-income families. Opposed to only giving me some reading, Dr. Garlick said that I should invite Dr. Flavia Pereira, Assistant Professor of Public Health and Community Medicine, to come speak to our class. Regardless of what the syllabus said, she came. Faculty from every school at Tufts make sure the topics that were important to us were being discussed. Dr. Garlic worked tirelessly to make sure that we saw every single science-based issue from different angles, even if that meant inviting people who were against every single aspect of his research. Anyone who takes this class can tell you that after participating in science of the human experience, you don't need to have a PhD in chemistry to feel truly comfortable having a conversation about science. We learned that the discussions about science should not be limited to those of us in lab coats. I see the work that Dr. Garlic and his co-teachers do, and I aspire to have a passion that burns as brightly. I feel that science, the human experience, encompasses what a Tufts education is and what it always should be. Thank you so much. Just from my mother. Amazing. <laughs> you said it much better than I could have. But I think we see that discovering in this class what science is means that science is accessible, science is personal, and science is relevant, and much more. You said it much more eloquently than I did. But we learned some lessons also. The faculty learned lessons as well. What I learned as a scientist was that, yeah, my lab is wonderful and I love the research. That's just the epicenter of my responsibility as a scientist. Because out from that epicenter, rippling out from that epicenter, are our responsibility to our communities and to society as a whole which I think is exactly, that's a great, that should be the insignia of the Tough Institute of Innovation, <laughs> is science serving society, which it is. <laughs> so what we bring together is this awareness of creating science literacy, finding a way to get our students to engage civically, and then to have a civil and respectful dialogue about potentially polarizing topics that need to be a conversation that deepens an understanding of all sides of that discussion. So, what's in the future? Where are we going to go from here? And what we've discerned is that we have defined a new field called civic science. And I'm thrilled that my colleagues at Tisch College, Dean Solomon and the amazing Peter Levine, are colleagues 
as we begin to think about ways to translate this scientific understanding into social action. How do we take that literacy, that understanding of what science means in our society, and translate that into democratic action? Well, there are really three processes that are involved. There's the scientific process, where we can use scientific knowledge as a resource. Use scientific knowledge as a resource for social change and democratic action. Not to inflame the knowledge wars, but actually to inform them. The civic process, and ultimately, the democratic process. So we can teach our students to engage in advocacy for what they believe in, as part of a collaborative team, engaging in respectful conversation, so they can take action following what we can teach them and share with them in the Tufts classroom and in their experiential learning environments. Ultimately, what we hope to achieve is to renew the links between science and democracy. And if that's not a tough, specific mission, I don't know what is. <laughs> we can do this better than anyone. So in closing, I just want to say how moved I am by what Daniel and Gabrielle shared with you. And what we all learn is that teaching the value and consequences of science is indeed to learn what it means to be human. Thank you very much.